Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about PTSD, or better known as Post Traumatic Stress Syndrome. I have been doing a series of mental illness slash disorder um, podcasts in a row. My thoughts were, I've been thinking of calling it quits on the podcast front, or well, you know, my uploading to YouTube stuff. And I started thinking, would I regret anything? And looking back on my like 350 somewhat videos, I didn't, I won't like regret like TV show, movie stuff. You know what? I'm not saying I'm definitely just quitting it, but there are lots been going on and I've been thinking of, um, you know, cutting it out for now at least. Anyway, uh, thinking about what I might regret and I regret I might have regretted uh, not doing a series on mental health issues, disorders, in a, in a bulk little nutshell. And looking back, I had done topics that touched on some of these things. But, again, I wanted to get this out. Get th And there's a lot of them. Like, looking back, I have some bookmarks that have five mental health disorders, nine, fifteen. <laughs> and, um... You know, the more we learn, the more things, spectrums grow, etc. In any case, today I'll be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. I'll be talking, I'll be reading an article on a, from the website, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health. And these sites don't give credit, I don't believe, because it's more of an educational thing. It's not a opinion piece sort of thing. I'll check real quick. I think I've done this so many times now. And what I'll do is I'll put the link to the article slash web page in my description, as I always do. If I forget, let me know. This way, someone else can read it. In a lot of these podcasts I do, as I'm reading, I, I might not mention there are highlighted words, or they're in blue, and they have links to other things, which you could do deeper dives in, in like to see the website or a part of a topic that I discuss. And it's always a good thing, especially when you want to like verify certain things and make sure a website is sort of legit, because who knows these days. But, again, I'll put the link for the article in the description. I usually read it word for word, but I'll interject things here and there. Uh, I'm trying to get a bulk of these done, because like I said, it's been... It's been... It, for me, the podcast will always just discipline and... Um, you know, a focus for some of my own issues and creativity. Like, I love TV shows and movies. And I'm so interested in neurology, psychiatry, all that stuff with the brain and the mind. And um, it's just been adding to my stress and my depression, like my issues. And with everything going on, adding to it. Because my problem is uh, more that... I deal with things on a one-to-one -one basis pretty well. I have my tools and my, you know, ways of coping and getting by and doing what I got to do. But when things start piling up is when I start um, feeling the stress and not being able to cope with it as well as I should. And it's not just more than one thing one that you know about. It's a lot of surprise stuff. It's the ticket you get in your car, you know, the car, something you got to fix, or it's an unexpected bill, or it's, you know, an unexpected death of a friend or a family. I mean, the list goes on. I'm not super special in that case of what happens to people in life. But again, this is going to be about post-traumatic stress disorder. The link will be in the description. And my roundabout thing is just saying I want to get a bulk of these mental health order, disorder things out of the way in case I do decide to stop doing podcasts, so I'll start. What is post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD? Post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder that develops in some people who have experienced a shocking, scary, or dangerous event. It is natural to feel afraid during and after a traumatic situation. Fear is a part of the body's fight-or-flight response, which helps us avoid or respond to potential danger. People may experience a range of reactions after trauma, and most people recover from initial symptoms over time. Those who continue to experience problems 
may be diagnosed with PTSD. Who gets PTSD? Anyone can develop PTSD at any age. This includes combat veterans and people who have experienced or witnessed a physical or sexual assault, abuse, an accident, a disaster, or any other serious event. People who have PTSD may feel stressed or frightened even when they are not in danger. Not everyone with PTSD has been through a dangerous event. Sometimes learning that a friend or family member experienced trauma can cause PTSD. According to the National Center for PTSD, which is highlighted in blue by the way, so it's a link you can go for it to the site, a program of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, about 6 out of every 100 people will experience PTSD at some point in their lives. Women are more likely to develop PTSD than men. Certain aspects of the traumatic event and some biological factors, such as genes, may make some people more likely to develop PTSD. Now, in my life, I don't know, maybe I'll mark a couple of things that were traumatic to me, but did they cause PTSD? Not sure. So going back really young would be uh, getting bit by a dog. My friend's dog was in the backyard, and we were just having fun. It was cold out. I had like a snorkel jacket on with the big furry collar thing, and the dog would bark normally, and you always knew, you know, your friends are young, I'm about seven, eight years old, old. and um, you knew the dog was like mean or whatever, but anyway, they let the dog out. Dog jumped on me, grabbed my arm, bit me, blah, 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 blah. Uh, whatever, it's okay, and I just said, uh, you know what, let me go. So, I'm leaving the backyard, not knowing, like, I guess I was in shock, and I get about three houses, down. so I walk out the alleyway, I was in the backyard, walk out, turn left, get about three houses down, and I get grabbed from behind by some woman, who I still don't know, I, I didn't, I, I don't, you know, it's been so long ago, and she grabs me, she's got this towel and a huge thing of napkins or paper towels or whatever the fuck it was I, you know my memory is shot and as i turned to her and looked she grabs my arm and there's blood trail leading from where i was standing all the way to the backyard so apparently the dog bit me and you know it was trying to drag me down like a, those police dogs do and i resisted and it bit right through the jacket into my arm i had like um Five holes in my arm, I guess. Um, bite, you know, teeth marks. But I didn't notice. I didn't feel it. I was just walking home like, what the fuck is this? Just another day, you know, a friend's dog bit me. And my whole hand is red. There's blood just dripping down. And it was... Anyway. So when you chalk that up, I might have had a fear of dogs for a while. But I don't think it developed into a traumatic thing. I was hit by a car. Uh, I flew like... 30 feet in the air, hit a sewer cap, um, and for a long time, you know, blah, 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 I had a scar on my forehead, it was a, a cross. Anyway, I don't think something like that did it either, but I can say that as I started getting older, I talked about this, watching my mother's mental health deteriorate, you know, um, I guess in the lore of the family, it's, she had a uh, operation, and that led to and abuse of painkillers and whatever, and the stress of, you know, trying to raise two children on her own, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, and going through that till I was 16 gave me a lot of maybe trauma in the sense of what I had to do. Um, the nights I would just stay up watching the foyer from the second floor window and watching her come in and having to run down and help her up. Lots of factors in, in there, but I don't think it developed a PTSD traumatic event. However, for me, it definitely is one where I was in a room with my best friends and one of their girlfriends, who was a best friend at the time, and my friend came in and shot himself with a gun. And I happened to have gotten up, I was closest to him, so I gotten up and I stood up, and it was about two feet, less than two feet away from him when he pointed the gun at his eye and pulled the trigger. So that is markedly for me a defining one. It it had all the symptoms that this thing will describe, flashes, um, any loud noises, any flash, my heart would race, I'd have insane flashbacks and dreams, 
of the gun going off, the blood, and, and the after effects of having to, um, you know, go with the police to the, um, well, the police had to escort me because a gun was involved. So the mother needed someone to identify the body with her. So I went with her, whatever, and they wouldn't let me go. So the police had to escort me. Then they spent 11 hours in the police station. Again, this whole thing was the most traumatic experience at the time. Probably still a shocking one. More akin to, you know, an accident or something frightening happens that's sudden. You know, and so that's a whole event. It's the suicide in front of me, the gun, the flash, the everything, the blood, the going to the hospital, identifying the body, and within the same amount of hours since it happened, 11 hours in the police station, so boom, there you go. Fuck me up to this day. And then it's probably... um Looking back now, is this is helpful to me, and another reason why I do this was um, my fiance, who I spent 17 years with, 13 of those years were her fighting cancer, and she eventually lost the battle around 2017-ish, and I gotta say, like, looking back, if I'm examining my life, or if I was trying to be more professional... I would say the long, drawn-out battle with my fiancé is more traumatic. However, I don't, like, label it as such with other people. Because this was someone you're in love with. You you know, we almost had a baby and she lost a baby. That led to finding out she had cancer. And for 13 years, fighting it. And I'm remembering that it's not the same thing as the flashes I would get or the... um, Trauma I sustained from watching someone, you know, kill himself in front of me with a gun, especially since he just pointed it at his eye, and we were facing each other from like a foot away. I was getting up, and I had gotten up and went to get it, but this was a long, drawn-out wearing of every the fiber of my being, where there were times she would forcibly tell me to leave her, to because I think she knew what type of person I was, very empathic, very sensitive to certain things and you know we're going on to how many things they took from her packing wounds um all the things you say to somebody knowing when it's getting close or it's just the whole most and that's still what i'm recovering from to be honest and that adds to everything so i just wanted to get that out in the beginning of this because you know what are the signs like for me I think the traumatic thing with my friend killing himself was something that I got over and something that is, um, in a way, different from the long, drawn-out wearing of your soul, so to, so to speak. Not that I believe in those things. Because in this 13 year, 17 years of being with her and her fighting cancer, there was a time where there were you know, remissions, right? And I had finished my book, and I had published it, and I had just gotten a Comic-Con table three weeks before the event started. And she got the call, test came back, cancer came back, and she never made it to the um, Comic-Con with me. You sit there, and again, so, so much such thanks and huge love to Steve, Eddie, Justin, Jimmy... All the friends who came with me every day, helped me set up my table, all my stuff, my book, my shirts, the hat, I mean, everything for the money they helped. It just, I don't know how I got through it, but it was after that and another three years or so of fighting, it just destroyed me. In any case, I'm going to continue now because, again, I'm trying to get these done and I just keep finding myself, you know. And a little bit of turmoil here and there, but I'll get through it. What are the signs and symptoms of PTSD? Symptoms of PTSD usually begin with three months of a traumatic event, but they sometimes emerge later. To meet the criteria for PTSD, a person must have symptoms for longer than one month. The symptoms must be severe enough to interfere with aspects of daily life, such as relationships or work. The symptom must also be unrelated to medication, substance abuse, 
or other illness. Of course, uh, the course of the disorder varies. Some people recover within six months, while others have symptoms that last for one year or longer. People with PTSD often have co-occurring conditions, such as depression, substance use, or one or more anxiety disorders. <laughs> Tell me about it. After a dangerous event, it is natural to have some symptoms. For example, some people may feel detached from an experience, as, they, as though they are observing things rather than experiencing them. A mental health professional who has experience helping, who has experience helping people with PTSD, such as a psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinical social worker, can determine whether symptoms meet the criteria for PTSD. To be diagnosed with PTSD, an adult must have all of the following for at least one month. At least one re-experiencing symptom, at least one avoidance symptom, at least two arousal and reactivity symptoms, at least two cognition and mood symptoms. Re-experiencing symptoms include experiencing flashbacks, reliving the traumatic event, including physical symptoms such as racing heart or sweating, having reoccurring memories or dreams related to the event, having distressful thoughts, experiencing physical signs of stress. Thoughts and feelings can trigger these symptoms, as can words, objects, or situations that are reminders of the event. Avoidance symptoms include staying away from places, events, or objects that are reminders of the traumatic experience. Avoiding thoughts or feelings related to the traumatic event. Avoiding symptoms may cause people to change their routines. For example, some people may avoid driving or riding in a car after a serious car accident. Arousal and reactivity symptoms include being easily startled, feeling tense, on guard, or on edge, having difficulty concentrating, having good difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, feeling irritable and having angry or aggressive outbursts, engaging in risky, reckless, or destructive behavior. Arousal symptoms are often constant. They can lead to feelings of stress and anger and may interfere with parts of daily life, such as sleeping, eating, or concentrating. Cognition and mood symptoms include having trouble remembering key features of the traumatic event, having negative thoughts about oneself or the world, having exaggerated feelings of blame directed towards oneself or others, having ongoing negative emotions such as fear, anger, guilt, or shame, losing interest in enjoyable activities, having feelings of social isolation, having difficulty feeling positive emotions such as happiness or satisfaction. Cognition and mood symptoms can begin or worsen after the traumatic event. They can lead to a person to feel detached from friends or family members. Um, it says if for you, there's a little thing here, if you know someone who's struggling with thoughts of suicide, call the suicide text or text the hotline at 9988-SUICIDE-CRISIS-LIFELINE or chat at 988-LIFELINE.ORG. Life-threatening situations, call 911. How do children and teens react to trauma? Children and teens can have extreme reactions to trauma, but some of the symptoms may not be the same as those seen in adults. In younger children, uh, when children younger than age six, these symptoms can include wetting the bed after having learned to use the toilet, forgetting how to talk or being unable to talk, acting out the scary event during playtime, being unusually clingy with a plant parent, or other adult. Older children and teens usually show symptoms more like those seen in adults. They also may develop disruptive, disrespectful, or destructive behaviors. Other children and teens may feel guilty for not preventing injury or deaths. They may also have thoughts of revenge. And to learn more about how to help children, there's a big blue link. You can hit that and go into a you know, it'll help you with that. Next is, what are the risk factors for PTSD? Not everyone who lives to a dangerous event develops PTSD. Many factors play a part. Some of these factors are present before the trauma. 
Others become more important during and after the traumatic event. Risk factors that may increase the likelihood of developing PTSD include being exposed to previous traumatic experiences, particularly during childhood, getting hurt or seeing people hurt or killed, feeling horror, helplessness, or extreme fear, having little or no social support after the event, dealing with extra stress after the event, such as loss of a loved one, pain and injury, or loss of a job or home, having a personal or family history of mental illness or substance use. It's so, like, when you read these things and you're somebody who, you know, suffers from some of these things, it's just, it's actually enlightening. Resilience factors that may reduce the likelihood of developing, developing PTSD include seeking out support from friends, family, or support groups, learning to feel okay with one's actions in response to a traumatic event, having a coping strategy for getting through and learning from the traumatic event, being prepared and able to respond to upsetting events as they occur despite feeling fear. Now, this is how, and it's going to go into it now, how to treat PTSD. This is what I mean by, I might just be lucky that I have learned tools and I was interested in this because of my mother's mental health issues. But I'll continue. How is PTSD treated? It is important for anyone with PTSD symptoms to work with a mental health professional who has experience treating PTSD. The main treatments are psychotherapy, medications, or a combination of psychotherapy and medications. A mental health professional can help people find the best treatment plan for their symptoms and needs. Some people with PTSD, such as those in abusive relationships, may be living through ongoing trauma. In these cases, treatment is usually effective when it addresses both the traumatic situation and the symptoms of PTSD. People who experience traumatic events or who have PTSD may also experience panic disorder, depression, substance use, or suicidal thoughts. By the way, a lot of those are just highlighted blue. You can hit the link. Treatment for these conditions can help with recovery after trauma. Research shows that support from family and friends can also be an important part of recovery. Psychotherapy. Psychotherapy, sometimes called talk therapy, includes a variety of treatment techniques that mental health professionals use to help people identify and change troubling emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. Psychotherapy can provide support, education, and guidance to people with PTSD and their families. Treatment can take place one on one or in a group and usually last 6 to 12 weeks but can last longer. Some types of psychotherapy target PTSD symptoms while others focus on social, family, or job-related problems. Effective psychotherapies often emphasize a few key components, including learning skills to help identify triggers and manage symptoms. One common type of psychotherapy, called cognitive behavioral therapy, can include exposure therapy and cognitive restructuring. Now, this is why I said, I guess I say this a lot because I'm doing this a whole you know, thing on mental health disorders and illnesses. But this is why in my Foundations for Wellness, I have the construct and I talk about um, what I do and what I would help people and friends with, with this type of issue or any type of issues. And it's a, more of a cognitive, cognitive behavior therapy, but it's a meditation um, breathing exercises that help you do this and it's saved my life to be honest um, let's continue exposure therapy help people learn to manage their fear by gradually exposing them in a safe way to the trauma they experience as part of exposure therapy people may think or write about the trauma or visit the place where it happened this therapy can help people with PTSD reduce symptoms that cause them distress Cognitive restructuring helps people make sense of the traumatic event. Sometimes people remember the event differently from how it happened. They may feel guilt or shame about something that is not their fault. Cognitive restructuring can help people with PTSD think about what happened in a realistic way. Medications The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, Administration FDA, has approved two selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. 
a type of antidepressant medication for the treatment of PTSD. SSRIs may help manage PTSD symptoms such as sadness, worry, anger, and feeling emotionally numb. Healthcare providers may prescribe SSRIs and other medications along with psychotherapy. Some medications may help treat specific PTSD symptoms such as sleep problems and nightmares. People should work with their healthcare providers to find the best medication or combination of medication and the right dose. To find the latest information about medications, talk to a healthcare provider and visit the FDA website. Then there's a link for that. How can I find help for PTSD? If you're not sure where to get help, a healthcare provider can refer you to a licensed mental health professional, such as a psychiatrist or a psychologist with experience treating PTSD. Find tips to help prepare for and get the most out of your visit and information about getting help. That whole little thing there is highlighted blue. Anybody needs help or any information, you can hit them. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has an online treatment locator to help you find mental health services in your area. That's also highlighted blue. Easy access and you find it easy. Here are some things you can do to help yourself while in treatment. Talk with your healthcare provider about treatment options and follow your treatment plan. Engage in exercise, mindfulness, or other activities that help reduce stress. Try to maintain routines for meals, exercise, and sleep. Set realistic goals and focus on what you can manage. Spend time with trusted friends or relatives and tell them about things that may trigger symptoms. Expect your symptoms to improve gradually, not immediately. Avoid the use of alcohol or drugs. How can I help a friend or relative who has PTSD? If you know someone who may be experiencing PTSD, the most important thing you can do is to help that person get the right diagnosis and treatment. Some people may need help making an appointment with their healthcare provider. Others may benefit from having someone accompany them to their healthcare visits. If a close friend or relative is diagnosed with PTSD, you can encourage them to follow their treatment plan. If their symptoms do not get better after six to eight weeks, you can encourage them to talk to their healthcare provider. You can also, or you also can, offer emotional support, understanding, patience, and encouragement. Learn about PTSD so you can understand what your friend is experiencing. Listen carefully, pay attention to the person's feelings and the situations that may trigger PTSD symptoms. Share positive distractions such as walks, outings, and other activities. How can I find a clinical trial for PTSD? This, this, I had this, I've been doing this so long that everyone ends with this, which is good. Clinical trials and research studies that took that look at new ways to prevent, detect, or treat diseases and conditions. The goal of clinical trials is to determine if a new test or treatment works and is safe. Although individuals may benefit from being part of a clinical trial, participants should be aware that the primary purpose of a clinical trial is to gain new scientific knowledge so that others may be better helped in the future. Researchers at NIMH and around the country conduct many studies with patients and healthy volunteers. We have new and better treatment options today because of the clinical trials uncovered years ago. Talk to your healthcare provider about clinical trials, their benefits and risks, and whether one is right for you. To learn about a study, visit, and there's links here, clinical trials webpage, this is great, highlighted blue. Where can I learn more about PTSD? Free brochures and shareable resources, all right here, highlighted blue, easy link, easy access, multimedia, there's even federal resources uh, section here. Research and statistics, so anybody who wants to see the numbers, this is at an excellent, you know, excellent uh, access to this. And that'll be it for this. Um, again, I keep feeling like I want to thank somebody. Like, you know, when you read an opinion piece or an article, it's always like, you know, Mary something. And I keep looking for it, and I train myself, I guess, to really, um, you know, really look into it. Oh, that is weird. Anyway. Also, there's journalistic auto articles. Hmm. Again, this was my podcast on PTSD. My 
brush with this, if we can call it that, is probably somewhat minor to a certain extent. You know, I was young, and again, you know, I look at some of the things that happened to me. Like, one of them was, I think it was 1982, whatever it was. I was like 11 or 12 years old. We were in the backyard with a radio. You know, boom box, I guess you call it. And we just happened to listen to Howard Stern. <laughs> and I don't know fucking why, but I gravitated towards it. It was just like, I think it was on NBC days. It was wackiness and silliness. But when I started working for my, at the time, girlfriend's father, delivering, ba have a bagel route and a bread route, he would listen to Imus and, uh, you know, Howard Stern and stuff. And he started talking about trans transcendental meditation. I got into meditation. So that's a oddity and a, I think a lucky thing for me, finding that at such an age. Because as I said, from the age of like 11 to 13, you're just about the time you graduate sixth grade, you know. I noticed a very s different um, aspect of my mother's life. When I, maybe just being older, getting older, we start noticing things. And by the time I'm 16, I've gone through this. She was in the kitchen, um, like 80 pounds, talking to herself and not eating, calling the cops on us, trying to get her help, and... I've gone through the ups and downs of from 13 to 16, you know, what I had to do, and, and it's just, you know, it, it builds up. And anyway, again, I lose my train of thought with these things. And I, I try to think, you know, am I really impacted? Am I lucky? Because when that happened by the time I was 16 and I knew I wasn't going to school, we just, you know, had to just get jobs, basically. Uh, I asked all my, anybody I could and get me information. I went to the library. I always loved the library. I've always been a big reader. And I started reading everything I could on psychiatry, mental health, uh, anything you can imagine has to do with the brain. And I've said this before, a lot of things that really are interesting and kind of more easy to get as a layman or an average person who doesn't have degrees is how magicians fool you, how mentalists uh, do their thing, you know, and how, you know, people are good at it, these psychic bullshitters and religious asswipes that fucking scam people. It's knowing about human behavior. We evolved. We have traits, you know. A magician, I say this so many times, I watch Penn and Teller, they can show you how the trick works, and they can fool you every time. Because they know where your eyes are going to go. They know what, how the brain processes information and sounds, how it creates a schema. You know, it's that thing about, um, don't talk about the elephant, in the, right? What are you thinking about the elephant? If I say red, the red barren plane, you think of the propeller plane. It's almost something that your brain, you can't, you know, there's always outliers, but it's just so in informing. And I just happen to be lucky. By the time I'm 16, I'm immersed in this meditation psychology life trying to help my mom and these are tools i developed and over the years just helped me survive i'm not better than anybody and i just want to help people and again i'll end this in a way with how i began it these podcasts on mental health disorders and illnesses or my way of, if I have to step away from doing podcasting and, you know, take time off or just leave it behind for good, would I regret anything? And thinking again, I said this in the beginning, in a lot of these podcasts, I'm not, I don't think I regret not doing season three of The Witcher, or, you know, although I'll probably watch it, but I would regret not putting as much information as I can, even if it's a wise ass from Brooklyn flubbing through everything, barely holding on to his own stress and emotions and shit. That it could reach somebody, it could resonate in some way. So I guess we'll end it there. Post traumatic stress disorder. These this website that I'm using, the National Institute of Mental Health, is what I've been doing for most of them. And it reads more like an educational thing and I wanted to 
get these done because I've done enough opinion piece stuff. So again, I'm, I don't have a degree, nothing, but I do have 36-ish years of deep dives and treating it like college courses and trying to, you know, at one time I was going to go into the offices and do um, therapy work in the waiting room. It was a whole thing I was going to do with uh, certain offices that were in the neighborhood, um, reaching out on suicide hotlines, things like that, and just learning the ins and outs. I even have the cards on the clinical psychology thing, like what they ask you every week. I don't know if I have many more, but anyway, this is fascinating to me. It's one of the things I wish we could help more people with, because in the end, forget religion and all the bullshit and, and why people are evil. It's all the brain. It has always been our brains. Everything is in there. Everything we need or will need will be unveiled in the brain. It's just what it is. And to even know it, to even say, oh, I knew, I read a podcast, or just the words that I'm reading. Even if I'm lying about everything, I've never learned about anything. I've at least done the podcast. And that's all I would expect for anybody to just listen to it. Now, you don't want to hear my stupid, silly, shitty voice and flubbing every word. Because the one I did before on uh, gender dysphoria, holy fucking shit. I destroyed the language, the English language. I fucking destroyed it. I flubbed so many times in that thing, I wanted to delete it. I didn't want to put it out. So I can get it, right? You know, I just want to, oh, what did Joe talk about today? Oh, here's the link for the description. In the description, I don't want to hear this fucking, you know, idiot smoke weed and you know, rant. Anyway, again, PTSD, my heart goes out to everybody, and you know, even when you talk about police officers and veterans, you might be on one side of the spectrum that says, oh, you know, fuck them, and they want to go to war, and uh, blah, 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 police, guns, you're all humans, we're all in this world together, and it just blows my mind that I look across the nation and the world and I go, there's still religion. And then you go, oh, there's still slavery. There's still uh, organizations and corporations that are willing to, you know, s sit in the shit and slop of fucking other nations and people who mutilate women and cover their face. Like, this whole thing is just so fucking shocking sometimes. But here we are. And here I am deciding if I'm going to do podcasts. Wanting no regrets, wanting to put as much information as I can out there. And I hope it helps somebody. So, some is coming. I don't know how I'm editing these things and putting them out. Like I said, I'm trying to do little bulks of them because my fucking world has just been, you know, hard to maintain a focus. And I want to send my love to everybody, friends, family. Even if I don't know you, I've never met you. I generally view humanity as... I love everybody until I learn information about them. And there's nothing we can do about that. We will form biases. And that just means I don't care about color, creed, you know, whatever the fuck your status is, money. It doesn't matter to me. You're a human. But once I start knowing you and we just, we fall into patterns. We are who we are, right? You know, I'm not going to be nice to a fucking criminal, uh, you know, whatever. But if he's stealing candy from the rich, giving it to the poor, like, I mean, there are nuances to this shit. But in general, I just love everybody. I wish the world was a big hug fest in my hippie days. And thank you, Joe, and all the friends who, you know, welcome home in the rainbow gatherings. So many things impact your life and give you tools and ways to navigate life. And that's what I think this is, my giving back in a way. So I hope everybody's doing well. Enjoy the summer. I love you all. I'll talk to you all next time.